Graham Truitt um, here. Graham is the leader of the MLC group at Comcast for Lag and Friday Lag. Um, so before before at Comcast, he worked at BGN, he worked at um, Shadow Street, he worked at Transportation and Space, um, which is a popular company that I'm very happy with. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about today. And our first Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, can everybody hear me well in the back? Do? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, really excited to talk here and um, talk about our work at Comcast. So um, I joined Comcast four years ago and you know we've grown quite a bit since then. Um, and um, now I'm responsible kind of end to end starting from you know, product um, and understanding the product and developing um, the problems that we need to work on all the way to operations and um, deployments. So um, this talk, I've tried to give that perspective of also working in industry, but also in, a, in the media uh, space. And um, so I'll try to keep the technical details. I try to keep some technical details in, but at a higher level, but I will point out publications and other reference points for you to take a look at, and also happy to answer any questions um, during that. So, um, so Comcast is a big corporation, um, and um, the, a lot of products and services that Comcast offers. The most um, uh, recognizable one is Xfinity. It's the brand of the residential services that Comcast offers. So, by show of hands, how many of you have had Xfinity Comcast services in the past? Okay, so. Big portion. Okay, um, so the X1 is actually the name of um, the Xfinity cable TV service and the new, kind of the, the next generation version of that. So if you've had cable TV service from any company before, um, you might have um, had an interface that doesn't look exactly like this. It might have been a more kind of a grid that you might have seen with channels and then timelines. So the X1 is kind of a response to like kind of going away from that and building a better modern design that is based on recommendations. And it also has voice as kind of the um, interface for um, a lot of the accessing the content. So um, this is kind of like the, one of the newer cable boxes that you might get as opposed to the really large, big, um, ugly ones in the past. Um, and the screen looks pretty much like if you were on Netflix, you see some you know, um, thumbnails and then some information and you, you get some personalized um, menus um, to browse through. So there are 30 million um, Comcast um, customers, residential customers, and 22 million cable TV subscribers um, across the, the US and recently we've been expanding into Europe. So I wanna talk about the data a little bit, start with that to kind of set the stage. So. Um, when you think about cable TV, a lot of people think about uh, live TV, what we call linear channels, um, and there are hundreds of them. Uh, that is, you know, a lot of the, the content that we, that we consume. But there's also a big on-demand catalog. So similar to if you go on Amazon Prime or Netflix, um, Comcast offers on-demand catalog that, that you can go through. It's over 50,000 movies and TV shows. Um, for the live TV, um, there are a lot of video streams. So one thing that a lot of people don't know is the streams for the same channel actually differs by region. So NBC in Baltimore and NBC in Washington DC might actually be a different stream and that allows um, content providers to have localized ads. Uh, it makes our life harder. Um, so we actually have to consume a lot of that. Um, and then for every stream, we actually have a lot of metadata coming in every second of the stream. So a lot of data going through our pipe. Um, and to access all this content really um, the vision um, starting a couple of years ago for Comcast um, in 2015 actually um, was to uh, use voice as the interface to access all this because otherwise it's very hard even to find a channel 
you might need to go through hundreds of channels. And you need to memorize the numbers, which is something that we didn't, we shouldn't really have to go through, right? So, but if you just say the name of the channel, you can go there directly. And that was one of the motivating factors of using voice in this space. Um, so um, Comcast in 2015 uh, built the voice remote as part of its hardware um, that goes with the cable TV box. So whenever you're subscribed, you'll actually get the voice remote for free and you can start using that with the X1. So it all comes as a package. Um, right now there are about 25 million voice remotes out there um, and every day we get six million unique users. Um, and in 2017, there were six billion queries for the whole year. This has grown quite a bit. Um, so today we get over 20 million queries a day. So it's, it's one of the bigger voice products out there that is facing directly um, residential customers. So um, today's talk is gonna focus on the voice part, right? Um, and just a closer look to the voice remote, there are newer versions of this coming out, um, but really it's a remote controller with a button uh, which you can hold and um, speak into it, and then when you release it, um, that will go through um, our pipeline. So I'll talk about the journey of that voice query. So let's say you hold, you say HBO, and then you release it. So the voice remote will stream that audio to our backend services, where we'll first do um, speech recognition. That will transcri transcribe the audio um, file into a query. And then that will go through NLP modules, so here you can see a bunch of black boxes um, for different reasons. We build different NLP systems. We'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. Um, but the common uh, thing here is that the input is a query and the output is an intent or representation of an intent. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. Um, hmm. Something happened to my box. There's a, supposed to be a setup box. Um, so the intent will go to the setup box and we convert it into an executable action and then that will then go back to your TV and do something. So hopefully in this case, it will tune you to the HBO channel. So what, what I wanna focus on from, from this is the NLP portion and today's talk. So the problem definition, we have an input query. Um, let's say it's Game of Thrones. As you can notice, there's a transcription error. That is where NLP starts. So we cannot assume that the transcription is correct. The output is an intent. And for simplicity in the beginning um, portion of this talk, I'm gonna assume that the intent is always a program. So there's a title associated with a query, that is the intent. Um, and then simply, um, if the intent is title Game of Thrones, um, the system action that we'll take at the end will just take you to the page um, for that show called Game of Thrones. So then what the problem here is that we're trying to solve is there's an input query Game of Thrones, there's a black box that we're trying to build that will produce an output intent um, that defines the title that you're looking for. Um, and we wanna represent it as a policy distribution across the entire catalog. So if your catalog had only three programs, this is what it would look like. Um, so at this point, you might ask the question, and we ask the same question, it's a valid question. How is this different than any other te text classification problem? Right, and so we wanted to answer this question. We wanted to see if it is indeed something, you know, more than just a simple text classification problem. And the first thing we did is we looked at the data. Um, so nobody had actually analyzed um, uh, multimedia data or entertainment domain data before in this context. Um, and there were other uh, 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 publications in the literature about other kinds of domains um, from Yahoo and from Google, especially on, on the mobile and the laptop side. So I'll talk a little bit about this. So um, there's some challenges that, um, that, that, that comes with the domain. So the first one that we found when we did an analysis is the queries are shorter and more diverse compared to other domains. So on average, um, there's a bit, uh, it's a, a bit less than two tokens per query. And um, because of the space, it's very entity uh, heavy. So, and there's lots and lots of entities in the catalog. Um, and also it's very dynamic. Every day, hundreds of new shows or episodes are added, new movies come up, and then others get removed from the catalog. Um, so one thing we found is 14% uh, of queries had at least one unknown token in it, which seems very high. Um, this is unknown to the embedding that we're using, so we're looking at some vocabulary. So somehow related to this also is the problem of ambiguity. 
So as you get very short queries, there's a higher chance that they're going to be ambiguous. Um, a good example is Chicago Fire. Um, so that could mean a MLS soccer team. It could also mean a TV show. Um, without any other information, we don't know which one it is. So there's some inherent ambiguity there. Um, also, there's a lot of movies and sequels and ver variations of a movie that um, at the end you get a lot of overlap between titles. So they're not the same, but they're related. So that's also another challenge. Uh, my favorite one is this last one, actually. Um, Big Little Lies, I don't know if you're familiar, it's an HBO uh, TV show that came out, and it was a very popular. After it came out, we noticed in our logs that we would get a lot of requests for Little Big Lies. And um, when we looked in more detail, we understood that people actually looking for the show Big Little Lies, they just um, misremembered the title. But a lot of people misremembered, so we have to figure it out, right? It's on us to take that challenge and take them to the right show. And if you think of like a simple bigram-based approach, if you look at the overlap between Little Big Lies and Big Little Lies, there is none. And there's always, because of the large catalog, there's always something that matches, right? So in this case, there's a movie called Little Big, and it's very tempting to actually just show that to the user if you don't know better. Um, so you might ask the question, especially for the Chicago Fire example, why not just personalize and understand what the user wants if it's ambiguous? If they're a soccer fan, they're probably looking for the soccer team. Um, so one challenge that is very specific to this domain is the TV interface. So when we looked at the literature, a lot of the uh, other companies, what they're doing, is they're doing two things. They're backing off to web search a lot, um, and uh, that is actually quite useful on a mobile phone or a laptop, but on the TV interface, as large as the screen is, you don't have a mouse, you don't have a keyboard, you don't have a touch screen. So it's actually quite difficult for the user to navigate through um, a ranked list of results. Uh, the other thing that um, it makes it uh, more, more uh, valuable to do a, a web search for those other use cases um, is that you personalize it really well, right? So on a mobile device, you know um, that you can personalize it well so that the, you, it's very likely that the top of the result is going to be the relevant one. As opposed to that, on the TV, it's a shared device. So essentially, the family household will share this device, so it could be the kids using it, the parents using it, it could be some guests using it. Um, and it's a whole other challenge to figure out which one it is. Um, it's something that we've looked at also, but also very challenging and noisy. Um, so finally, um, NLP starts with the output of ASR. So there are a lot of speech recognition errors that come. Um, this is not unique to this domain, but one aspect of it that's unique that we found as part of this analysis is that um, as opposed to you know something like Siri or Google Assistant, um, which is on you know mobile um, or personal devices, um, here we found that um, our customer base actually includes a lot of children. So kids love to use the voice remote, which is great, but that also means they're going to use the voice remote a lot um, to find their cartoons. So um, we found also part of this analysis that there's a Canadian cartoon called Caillou. Um, and the kids would love to ask for that. They want to watch it. And a lot of times the transcription would come out as you. So it's either because they didn't hold it um, soon enough or just one thing that I realized as part of this was that ASR is just not as good for um, children as opposed to um, adults. Um, so this is just this challenge um, that we have to face. We have a larger portion of kids in the, um, in the customer base. Um, and that's the input. So um, as part of this analysis, we looked at some uh, frequency metrics. Um, obviously, you're going to see a Zipian distribution, a lot of very frequent queries, and then a long tail of um, rare queries. Um, one interesting thing that, that came out, and I wonder if you can guess what's the most frequent queries that we might get in, in the voice remote. Any guesses? So the top one is actually Netflix. And so this is interesting. It's actually um, a couple years back, um, Comcast and Netflix came, made the deal. Turned out to be a really good business deal for both. Um, that all of the Netflix content, uh, and since then Amazon Prime and others, are actually indexed in our system. So with the same voice remote, you can actually access all of that if you're subscribed to Netflix. Um, so it's a little bit cheating because Netflix is a lot of different shows together, and people just like to get to the app. Um, but Netflix and YouTube are actually the top three quarters. And then people look for their recordings. For those who don't know, there's something called DVR, and you can actually record shows and then watch them later. Um, so a lot of people still do that. Um, and then CNN, and uh, of course, free movies, all of our favorites. 
content at no price. Um, we looked at the length, as I said, shorter queries. Overall, a lot of queries that have only a single token. A lot of those are channel names, actually. Um, but also a, a good amount of queries that are very long. Um, so these are a couple examples that I like to show. The last one I clicked that I like. Watch filmed at suspenseful, but not too scary. Something to keep me on the edge of my seat, but not something that will scare me, is what they said into the voice remote. Um, and you know, it's a valid request. And uh, you know, we need to deal with that challenge as well. Um, so one big thing that came out of this analysis that really le lead, uh, leads to the next portion um, of our work is uh, the idea of voice session. So we looked at some of the work in uh, information retrieval, and it's very common to actually look at user sessions as a, a consecutive a sequence of queries that are looking for the same information um, request, right? So centered around the same information request. And we saw the same thing on the voice remote. People were looking for some content. They ended up using the voice remote a couple times. They might be navigating, they might be exploring. Um, and we noticed from our analysis that this could be useful for us to build a more accurate system. So what we do is we sessionize data to look at queries that are coming from the same device um, within, uh, that are consecutive uh, with a certain time gap. Um, and a lot of sessions have only like a single query, but if you look at the total traffic that's coming from sessions that have more than one query, it's about half of all the traffic. So it's important to really understand this and use as much as possible that context to improve um, our, our analytics. So then the next question that we ask is how do we, so we, we looked at all the challenges, yeah. So it depends on different cases, but most of the cases I would say is just something happening on the display, something showing up on the screen. Yeah, there's no voice out except for some promotional cases. Um, yeah, so going uh, back to the challenges, how can we overcome the ambiguity and the ASR transcription errors? Uh, example game is throw, right? Um, and the idea was to use voice sessions as context into our NLP model. So we want to change the problem description a little bit where we look at a session as input and then at every step of the session we want to make up for that and try to find the intent. And that intent should be um, to use the knowledge of the previous queries in the session so we can make a better um, prediction. So um, for this we want to collect data in the form of tuples of sessions and associated corresponding programs. Um, each session is a sequence of queries. Um, and then we want to find the model that maximizes for each of these sessions and for each of the queries in the session um, the probability of predicting the right program. Yeah, so it's a simple formulation given that analysis that we did um, that then leads into a decomposition where uh, we're making the assumption, a couple of assumptions to simplify. The prediction is based on a single um, representation of the entire session, which we call the contextual embedding. And then the contextual embedding depends only on the sequence of query embeddings in that session. Um, and then the query embedding depends only on the query. Which leads very nicely, um, as you might expect, into a neural network um, with each layer defining one of those um, decomposed uh, components. So here you can see that at the bottom there's a query that gets looked up. Um, And at the top, we have a fully connected layer with a soft mask activation to produce that probability distribution that we want. Okay. Yes, I'm going to talk about that right after. We also built a simplified version of this, removing that extra contextual layer to understand the difference and to um, validate our hypothesis that that is useful. Okay. So we have the model, um, but how do we train it? Right? How do we learn? 
So one idea that we had was we wanted to learn from user interactions. We get lots and lots of data every day, um, and it's really impossible for us to go and annotate that much data, especially in the beginning of a project like this. You can't convince anyone to spend a lot of money doing annotations, and that's one thing I found in industry that the data set is not given. So we had to collect it. Um, so we wanted to go back and create a feedback loop from what happened at the end back to the end ultimate. So this is how we did that. We collected logs from all of our users and looked at two different things. One is what they viewed, what they watched, and the other thing is what they said into the voice email. Um, we um, grouped all this by device um, and then put, we put it on a timeline. So once you do this, you can look at, this is a, an example of one of our users. So at 10.43, they were watching the sales question that was on their screen. Um, and at 10, a couple seconds later, they talked into the voice email. Um, they talked into the voice note three times. The first time, the transcription was kids. Second time, it was it is baking championship. And then third time, it was kids baking championship. And then after that, we observed that uh, the um, started seeing a different program called kids baking championship. So from this observation, we associate this voice segment that has three quarters in it with the label, the program kids baking championship. And this is how we decided to um, create a label data set which is a weekly supervised data set, um, and there's a lot of noise in it. This is a good example. There's a lot of bad examples also. But the idea was if we have enough of this, which we can produce automatically from all of our logs, we can train a model that can get good signals and then learn something. <coughs> so of course we had to test that idea. Um, we collected data over a week, and uh, we split it into train validation tests, and we looked at some uh, metrics um, uh, based mostly on ranking. So we looked at the precision at one. This is something that the product is mostly interested about because that's most of the times what we will go with at the end as the action. Um, precision five and um, our MRR. Um, as baselines, we looked at some of the obvious IR baselines like TFI, DF, and BM25 that keep working really well, um, even with the neural models out there. Um, and then a learning to rank approach uh, based on SPM. And then at the time, uh, Deep Structure Semantic Models from Microsoft was um, coming out, so we used that also as, as a neural baseline. So looking at the results, the first thing um, in this table to look at is that the best baseline is from GSSM. It's still lower than our basic model, so the basic model doesn't have the contextual layer. So by just um, using LSTMs, we were able to get a better result. But also when we looked at the contextual models, it actually worked. So, um, you know, we, 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 we try to understand why. Um, and so uh, what happens here, most probably, is that there went may, uh, way more parameters in the contextual model. And then we were able, not able to actually learn all of that um, with this um, optimization on the data, um, with the training process. So the idea then was to actually do this in two steps. So in the pre-trained version, what we did is we take the, um, we train the basic model, we take those two layers, and we initialize the contextual model with that. That allows it to actually start from somewhere more meaningful and then focus on the contextual layer to learn in the second stage. So um, it was a better um, approach for optimization, and we ended up with um, good to see significant improvements uh, using this approach. <coughs> we also looked at the um, embedding representation, very slight improvement um, to something that's interesting maybe to put in a paper but not something that would actually do in, in um, you know in the application itself because it complicates the whole process and it makes it slow um, so does context really help we got these results but we wanted to really see some examples where it was helping um, one um, uh, example here is what we did is we looked at all the sessions that had six queries in them and then we looked at our precision at every level of the, um, after we saw every query. So after every query comes in in the session, we make a prediction and we looked at how accurate each model was um, in that process. So one thing here you can see is the model going to the right here and going to the right and the right, whereas the basic model has no left here. And uh, this can be attributed to the fact that the queries in uh, previous to the current query is helping the model to make better. Um, and we also gathered a lot of examples. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So in this case, we're looking at, so we're, we haven't deployed the model yet, right? So people are using it without knowing. We're not giving any feedback. So we're just looking at historical logs. So that way it's really, it's not uh, tainted by the fact that we're actually um, directing them. Anymore. So um, here's an actual example I think that might be more useful. So um, uh, this is a, a case where probably um, a, a kid was trying to get to Caillou. Um, so Caccio was the first run system, U, U, Caillou. Uh, so the label that we automatically generated was Caillou because they, they ended up getting there, uh, which is crucial to getting us, for, for us to get positive feedback. Um, and if you look at the IR um, baselines and the SSM, so they can't really, they couldn't really get anything. Um, right until the day. So we have to wait for four queries um, until we could understand that they're looking for Caillou. Um, most of the other um, predictions are based on some lexical math. Right? So the basic model, um, Caillou is not, but U is somehow associated with Caillou, so it's learned that. Um, and you see there's a confidence of 27. Um, when you get to the final query, it's 100% sure that they're looking for Caillou. So if we had this model, we could have actually Um, looking at the contextual model, it's actually the same as the second query. We're able to get to the right program. But one interesting thing is look at the confidence. So here the query is two. So this is how you get 69%. And third time, the query is exactly the same as two. So the basic model would, would give us the exact same confidence. But the contextual model actually here learns that if we get you twice in a row, that, that it's more likely that they're looking for Caillou. And uh, from that, we can get a confidence of 0. 0.8. OK, so we built a model. We learned how to train it. We got some good results. So now we actually put this into production in front of you. Right? Um, so before we did this work, um, we were using a cascade of NLP modules, um, mostly based on pattern matching. Um, you can see here like the different um, models um, and how what percentage of traffic they're taking. So mostly it was this um, approach that was based on um, a search-based uh, approach that was taking the traffic. And the purple one is the queries where we couldn't really understand what they were saying, so we're saying we didn't quite get that. So it was about 8% of the traffic. And the goal here was to really use this model to reduce that, to increase our retail. So then um, we built this model and we only apply it to the cases where we don't have a response from any of the other models. So we played it really safe. Um, and we're able to get 75% recall on the no response queries. That would be no response um, beforehand. Um, this was with a manual um, annotation um, and 80% uh, precision. So we responded to 75% of the queries and on those we got 80% precision. Um, so this is then what deployed into production um, and to this day we're using some variation of this model that handles about a million of the queries that we get. So it's nice to see those purple become orange. Okay, so um, so we built this model, we put it into production. Now we're actually able to predict programs. When somebody's looking for a program, we can use machine learning to do a better job at predicting which program they're looking for. But part of this analysis that we did on the data was that people are not just looking for that. They're using this voice interface for a lot of different things. And um, so this shows you a little bit of that. So there's a lot of looking for channels. But there's a lot of cases where they just want to browse the catalog, um, and they're also longer tail of looking for people, setting up recordings, um, looking at the weather. There are a lot of different features that we've added over the years that we want to support, also with machine learning, with our deep approach. So um, how to do this? Um, and uh, the idea here was to use multitask learning and to split the model, uh, split the problem into different pieces. So we could solve them in conjunction and then get a more structured outcome. So we decided to d break this into three different tasks. One is to predict the intent type, um, which are some categorization that was already done. Um, predicting the parameters for each of those intent types, giving the intent type, getting all those parameters by doing tagging on the query tokens. And then the final one is what we did before, was to predict the program title. So we built three different models that work together, or three different layers that work together to produce something like this, right? So in this case, it would represent it as an intent type of viewing something. There are no parameters that we need except for the title that is being shown. 
but also a query like this, where the intent type is really about browsing this catalog. Now here you need to have a lot of parameters to execute the right action, right? The user was looking for something very specific. They wanted to see free movies, um, so the type was movie, the cost is free, the genre is action, and the channel is HBO. So you need to get all of those right to truly understand the intent here. And there's no actual program title in this case. So this same framework could work for a lot of different, more complex queries like this. So it's very similar to before, where the data now also has um, three different uh, labels, the program, the action, the intent type, and the tag for the token. So we very similarly decomposed it, but now we have different layers for each of those tasks. Right? So this part is pretty simple. We encode some types, and then we want to make three different predictions. Um, so the tagging one will make predictions at the query level, uh, intent classification will do at the session level, and then the program prediction is what we did before. Um, here we used a little bit different approach where we did some negative tests. to learn how to discriminate between programs that might look similar but are not the right one that we're looking for. So to train this, um, we did it in a two, here. Yes, uh, so every word, yeah. Y right, so yeah, that's kind of missing here. Um, so. For each of those, we define a tag on at, at the token level. So then, for instance, let's look at this example here. So here, you might want to so you want to tag free as a cost or as maybe a company label, and then have action as a genre, maybe as a type. And there might have been two words, for instance, that could have been tagged the same. And then we'll have a logic that might be So by wouldn't have any tag. It would just be contextual. Um, and then HBO would have a channel. So, um, so this work was um, published at KDB. The, the previous one was published at CIKM the year before. So you can look into more details there also. Um, so the idea here was to do a two-stage training. So in the first one, um, we wanted to do an overall training of all the layers. Um, and then in the second one, we want to go more specifically into the output layers. So I'll sh demonstrate how that works. So in an abstract level, we have the shared layer. That's the actual um, encoding part. Uh, then we have the program, the separate layer. And then we have two fully connected layers um, for the two um, classification tags, tagging and classification. So in the first stage, we focus mostly, um, we put a lot of weight based on the idea that that was the most um, difficult um, problem to solve. Um, and we, we, we enable all the parameters, so all the parameters were running in the first stage. At the end of the stage, we actually we assumed that the program encoder and the shared layer would, would have been converged. Um, and then we just wanted to focus on these three layers to make sure that those were actually doing well on their uh, corresponding well. And Right now, there might be a lot of different ways to actually do this, but at the time, this was a heuristic that we um, that we developed. Um, and then going through a similar evaluation, um, we collected data. Um, now we had to collect all the tag information as well, and then the intent. And so here, looking at the results, um, again, similarly, uh, looking at the baseline for the program very different results. Um, and then um, when we look at um, the new model, so even without the multiplex screen, the new model becomes a little bit more simple to compute. Uh, after that, by just optimizing the parameter itself. Um, looking at the other task, for instance, classification, uh, we actually have a baseline for that. Based 
category that um, we were able, we, we got um, better results compared to them. Any questions? So I'll kind of pause here and talk like just um, talk a little bit about like what we learned from this. Um, and then I'll continue with some other extensions of the work and some other pieces that we put together. So, I mean, really the takeaway from all this, you know, um, research and actually making it into production um, was, you know, compared to um, more academic research, we actually had to work really closely and align the formulation with the data that we had and the product requirements. Um, you know, I was used to doing research in an academic environment where the data was there, the problem was defined, and we just had to find the approach that worked best for it. And this was really a, a very different challenge where we had to define the problem first in a way that it makes sense um, for the product, um, but also collect the data and find the data that could actually help us do that because it's not always available, what, what you need to solve a problem. Um, Another thing that we learned um, was that if you have a product that has a lot of usage, we should use that to, um, to train your model, to learn from. So there are a lot of user interactions that were basically wasted before we did, before we did this work. Um, and we, if even though it was very noisy signal, we just were able to produce some um, heuristics to train our models. Um, and that worked out in the end. The nice thing about this is it's free data, but it's also because data keeps changing. Even with a you know a, an army of annotators, it's impossible to to um, to do this properly because you have to keep changing the training data and keep retraining your model. Um, so that's not really an option. And then finally, on the modeling side, we learned that you know context and the idea of user sessions also applied in this case. Um, multi-dust learning helped with optimizing when we wanted to produce a structure as opposed to just a program label. Um, and uh, so that's how we formulated the problem. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I'll go to a couple more kind of tangents and talk a little bit about these. And then we can see, um, um, depending on your interest, we can um, stop there or um, continue. So. One question that came out also um, as an extension to this is, um, you know, uh, the, the product here that we're talking about is, you know, centered on entertainment, but it's also really the vision for our technology was to build something that works across different domains and skills. So if you're all familiar with Alexa and Amazon Echo, really the idea is we built something for the home to make a smart home um, technology available so that voice can be the interface to really do a lot of different things. Um, uh, Comcast also has, you know, home security products. Um, so, and also, um, Comcast was also interested in using the same NLP technologies to improve its customer care. I'm sure you've heard about Comcast customer care. Excellent. Um, so, uh, this was another challenge um, that we tackled. So, these are some examples of different things that we want a person to look at. Let me mic up. Um, who's playing in the play? Uh, turn on the light. All of these to be able to go through the training system and produce the results that they're looking for. So to understand the intent is still the question. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, there are some guardrails around getting to different content that can be uh, managed by the adults in the, in the house. Um, it has to be uh, manually uh, set um, at certain times. Um, also, we have looked into voice uh, biometrics to really capture that, but um, it's proven to be a very challenging problem. So we can't really do it as accurately as we want. So I think it still has to kind of be administered by someone to make sure that doesn't happen. That's a good question. So kind of going back to this, um, really these black boxes could be NLP systems for different domains, right? So it'll look something like this. Um, so for entertainment, talked about an NLP system that we built. We could use similar techniques to build an NLP system for, for the home domain, for music, for customer care, so that all of that is accessed to the same interface. 
And the way we solve this problem is to have some kind of domain selection at the beginning based on the query to pick which of these domains are relevant to a given query. And then at the end, if there are more than one domain that applies to a query, to have some way of deciding which one is the most um, relevant one. So one example for this is turn on the key. And it's a good example to show how a query might be very ambiguous across domains. Um, the person might be looking for the movie called The Heat. They might want to increase the temperature in their home. They might be going for Miami Heat in a sports game, right? So in that case, we might just send that query to all those domains and then get a response. And then based on the response, make a decision at the end. So the initial um, domain selection is a very high resolve process. We want to make sure that we send it to all the domains that might be applicable. <clears throat> and then based on the response that we get from each domain, we combine a bunch of contextual signals and some uh, also business rules to make the, the final call which one to execute. And the idea here is really to build a language model for every domain. So we capture the space of where the queries lie. And then for every domain, make this decision based on a language model score to decide whether that query is for them or not. So again, we build a, a, a LSTM-based model, um, again, exploring different kinds of word embeddings. But at the end, we're able to get a language model that we use to solve this problem. And a, a lot of the challenge really is to tune that cutoff value. And that was something that we had to collect a lot of data for, in this case, manually on the data table. Um, so another question was um, how can we learn a model? So we talked about the home domain, the customer care domain. In those cases, we don't have that data that we talked about for the entertainment domain. So how can we even train a model for this? Um, if we don't have that data, we can't really use machine learning. So it's a cold stop problem. And um, the solution to this was to actually go to synthetic data generation based on rules. Um, again, this is something that you know I wasn't very familiar with coming from academia. Synthetic um, data is not something that really is um, uh, explored a lot. But in industry, I've noticed that this is actually a lot of times a necessity um, because of the constraints um, and just the uniqueness of the problem. You can't really just use any other data set. You don't have anything. Um, so what we do is we actually um, have editorial rules that are created that gives us some starting point. Right? With editorial rules for the entertainment domain, you might have rules like this, where the left-hand side is some kind of pattern of queries. And then the right-hand side is actually the intent that we're looking for. So the, um, the, the right-hand side is what we call the logic response. Essentially, it's the um, action um, combined, which is the predicate, combined with the list of arguments and their value. So taking these rules and then taking uh, a definition of what each of these stakeholders should be, we can actually generate data from that. So this gives us a good starting point. It's not ideal because it's synthetic. We don't really know if the distribution makes sense. That allows us to train an initial model from which we can then generate some user interactions and then feed that back into our training process. It also allows us to um, get a better coverage because one problem that we found with using production logs, um, as useful as it is, is that um, the long tail of things that people don't ask for a lot don't really get covered in that training data. So having the synthetic data combined with the usage data is actually like a good sweet spot where you can get a lot of coverage by having every single uh, editorial rule be um, included in the training data, in addition to getting a lot of the feedback from the user interactions to get a better sense of um, what the intent should be. So these are some examples where we could essentially generate a lot of different versions of queries synthetically. And this really allowed us to um, you know, for other cases, we couldn't really get examples of maybe certain logical forms, but this way we could generate as much as we can. So for the, for the uh, multitask learning approach, we've actually um, explored an alternative to that recently. Um, and that is really to just do um, sequence of sequence learning. Right. Now that we've actually represent the intent, that structured prediction problem as really a logical form, it really becomes a sequence to sequence problem where the input is the query, <coughs> and then the output is this logical form representation. Where we so this is from the sports domain where 
you know, when is DC United playing? Um, here, the logical form. So the intent type is scheduling. Um, and then there's one argument for that, team. And the value for that should be DC United. And so on. So this is how we formulated the problem. Um, and then we tokenize the query, so we get a sequence of tokens, and then the same on the logical form side, so that we can actually go from a sequence of tokens to a sequence of, uh, to generate a sequence of tokens as well. And so I won't go to too much detail, but you know we have kind of stack LSTMs to do the encoding of the code, and then other stack LSTMs to do the decoding for that as well. Um, and this is um, really um, following some of the literature to use attention and copy mechanisms. Um, so at the top, you can see here that based on the embedding, um, the encoding, the final uh, latent um, encoding here, we um, end up with an attention vector, and then um, that um, ends up here. Um, and in terms of copy the code, so again, um, this is the code and then it's combined with attention and the copy um, vector to make a decision of whether we want to copy um, a token from the input or not. And this is very useful for things where there's a lot of different entities. We don't want to really put them in the encoder with that way. We just want to copy it over from the input. Uh, so we make a decision if we want to copy or we want to uh, generate. And then we generate based on that attention vector. So I'll show you some examples. So when we train a model like this, Generating um, so here the logical form is full standing. So when the conference is the conference, it reaches full standing. The core reaches full standing. Right? The core is full standing. The core is full standing. Um, and here you can see that the extension, the lighter value, um, the lighter color, so the extension of the core of the Pangolin is the most full standing. Um, so here you can see that you know, we're generating the full standing. That really allows us to generalize and to be able to um, capture what part of the input is important when we're making the prediction. Okay, so um, I'll end with this slide. Basically, um, you know, we have a lot of interesting problems um, at Comcast that require natural language processing and working um, with an amazing team. Um, some of them shown here that have worked on these uh, problems. Um, and, you know, um, we're not as big of a team as, you know, some of the giants like Amazon or Google, but, you know, we're very focused on a certain domain, and that brings a lot of interesting, um, unique problems that we try to solve um, using, um, you know, both what we learn from the literature, but also um, we need to provide some custom solutions in those times. Um, and one of the advantages of working for an entertainment um, company is that you can actually win an Emmy. So um, two years ago, this team uh, won an Emmy Award, the same Emmy Award that actors and you know, um, show business people win, um, with a less glamorous um, ceremony, uh, a lot of tech people. Um, but you know, we have an Emmy Award um, in, in our office, so that's cool. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot that I didn't talk about today that is going on in our lab um, on the NLP and speech side. Um, and so I've just listed a couple of them here, but um, we also have a website they can go to and you can look at my papers to get more information. And you know, if you're interested in collaborating and in doing an internship or looking for full-time positions, let me know um, and we can get in touch. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you all.
um, so it, it does actually take it into account. Um, so the um, so I mean one thing to point out is we're not building the ASR in-house today. Um, we're using a third party for it. We're building some components um, to ex uh, expand on it, but we're still relying on third party most of the time. Um, so that third party, we're working with them to actually build language model that is um, uh, trained on the, our domain. So it does look at all the different movie titles that come in and trains on that. So actually a lot of times the problem is the, on the other side, like overfitting. So it might generate some movie title, even though you don't actually say that. So one example for this that I was uh, demonstrating once was, um, if you say How I Met Your Father, you'll never ever get How I Met Your Father as an answer. It will always give you How I Met Your Mother because it's so over overfitting so much into the domain. Um, but yeah, with the Game of Thrones example, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but um, it does also go that way. But it, it, it's trying to actually produce something um, that's an entity in the space, which is also a challenge if you want to go through multiple domains and expand into the smart home space. It can't really be that rigid. So it's a challenge. One of the reasons that why we're not doing it in-house as, as a complete solution is it requires a lot of um, expertise and a lot of more models, the more we into, right? Yeah, that's, that's what it is. For, NLP, for NLP side, it's about 100 milliseconds. That's pretty much how much we have on average. Um, at the P99 level, maybe a couple of hundred milliseconds we can afford. Um, but yeah, um, this doesn't include ASR, just the NLP side. Um, that's, and we've been able to achieve that. Um, and we're only using CPUs in production. We don't actually leverage CPUs for inference. We only use it for training. Um, but we managed to keep it that way. And that really makes it very important when you're um, structuring the uh, neural architecture to really be aware of that. Um, because any layer that you add, and this is why like, we couldn't use Elmerford. It just wasn't there. It was very, very slow. We have to actually, we have to look into how to compress it, which is one of the directions that we're taking, is to take those bigger models and compress them. Um, but latency uh, limits us a lot. But it also produces something that's useful. So we, it's just it's, it's part of deploying things that are safe and testing. Um, Endpoint latency, um, I think, is around two and a half seconds. Um, it involves a lot of things. But one of the biggest um, portions of that is actually you have to look up whether that person has access to that content. And that takes a long time. Right? Even if we know what to show, uh, you can't just say HBO and get to HBO because you have to be subscribed to it. So the whole business model complexities also, um, you know, comes down to the actual algorithm and uh, the challenges. Yeah. So <coughs> we have a couple of heuristics to reduce that kind of noise. <coughs> One of them is they, they watch it pretty much right away after, uh, right after they issue the query. And then also that they watch it for a certain amount of time. But as you said, sometimes people are just kind of exploring. So even if we show the wrong thing, they might just go for it. Or sometimes they'll watch the right thing for a little bit, but then they'll actually change their mind and then go use the remote to go to the next channel and they watch that for a long time. So there's a lot of noise that ends up there, and that's why it was a little bit, uh, we didn't really know whether this was gonna work or not. But, you know, I guess this is like one of those examples where enough data solves the problem, and uh, just the positive signals win over the negative signals. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, we have recently developed the engineering side of that to be able to do that. So that's a quite interesting direction actually now because we can actually ingest what's on the screen, even like all the titles, all the words on the screen, to actually influence the NLP model. 
Um, we've been starting to doing that with just some simple uh, business rules um, to increase our accuracy. Um, but that would be an interesting next direction to actually make that as part of the content. And you know, the, always the kind of the, the interesting uh, question is like, should we make that as part of the context of NLP, or should we just let NLP work on the query itself, and then in the next step downstream to use the context to um, to uh, because that also separates the problem better, so you can focus on one problem and then solve the next problem downstream. And that's usually been our approach to really not add any kind of personalization on the NLP side and do personalization. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, from what I see, from what you know, uh, folks at Amazon published and like other companies, kind of more recently, um, it seems like there are some of the problems. Um, it's one particular difference with the Alexa is that um, the problem of picking the right domain. They take a different approach where they actually always have some kind of keywords to tell them which skill it is. But also on their side, they have thousands and thousands of skills because anyone can actually um, add skills into the system. We kind of control the the, um, the space a little bit more by adding those domains one by one and having control over it, whereas just letting developers add skills into the system. So that's one place where the, the there's it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but um, otherwise, I don't know exactly if you know the structured prediction problem is something. Um, that they're tackling that way or not, I haven't seen any, um, any work on That's definitely where um, our mindset is to some degree. They've made it a bit too much. Um, uh, I mean, Comcast has been looking towards getting into the same kind of um, Far field devices, always the same devices. Um, I'm not sure if that will ever happen, but they have been looking into it quite a bit. Um, and that is the kind of the vision for us to be able to handle all that. And that's kind of where the structured prediction um, came about. Is like we don't want to just limit this to this. Uh, we also understand that the, the you know the entertainment business um, is changing a lot, and you know um, the from business value point of view, expanding makes a lot of sense because they can generalize their searches and and pick up uh, new customers. Customer care is one of them where it's kind of a bigger business for us now. It's kind of growing, whereas TV is kind of slowly going down. Um, but yeah, so I think like the way we're thinking of this logical form structure is we want to make sure that it, it, it can handle a more general set of um, intent. Um, of course, there's al always some limitation to that. One example is um, especially with customer care, we see these, we actually enable this NLP system on the phone and on the web. So they can type in queries and they can also type in on the keyboard. So on the web especially, what we see, especially with pissed off customers, they have really, really long queries where they just explain the whole situation. Like, this happened and then they came to my house and then this and then that and that. And we, it's very hard to label that with just a logical form, just saying this is the intent. There are a lot of different intents in there there's a lot of sentiment in there, so we're trying to still figure out exactly how we should, you know, capture all that without complicating also our model team. So that's always been kind of where we want to find that, you know, right balance.
that's, that's a good question. I, I might have not pointed that out, but yeah, our team is a combination of researchers and engineers. Um, we've made this uh, conscious decision um, a couple years ago to combine them, um, to really be more agile, because in the past it was exactly that, scientific solution, kind of throw it out and then make sure like in a year or two it gets into production. Now we're trying to get to the speed of what tech companies do where within minutes you have your solution out there from the customer. We're not there yet, but you know we can sort of we can we can have we can go from idea to customer in days now, which is you know an improvement from before. But we're going in that direction. So it's all embedded. Um, you know, quality assurance, operations. Everybody is in uh, my team to make sure that we don't have any dependencies on any other team to um, to deploy them. This, we have a whole separate team that um, uses also some third-party um, database to get that information and ingest it in a way that, um, uh, or uh, index it in a way that we can then ingest it into different, a lot of different applications. Um, that has all the information that you, know, you might imagine about the movie, all the tasks in it, where that task also, other movies that they've cast and all the connections in the graph, um, what the movie's about, uh, description, all the different tags that come with it. Um, so like part of like the movie table by topic is actually, so you can look for movies that have a certain tag that's editorially added, but also we are doing this kind of more semantic search based on all the content um, in the description. And, and also other ones, right? We also have teams looking at all the closed captions in a movie that's quite an interesting feature to get some into um, because we have all that data. Every scene of every movie, the closed captions are available. So in the U.S., you're actually um, you, you're legally required to keep the closed caption content. So that means there's a really rich amount of data for every movie. Um, the challenge with the closed captions is just so much that we've always failed at really being able to kind of extract useful, useful information at some semantic level from that and try to understand movies. But you know, I've I've had uh, research projects where we tried to kind of create a storyline um, in some semantic way, and then find connections between different movies just looking at the closed captions. But yeah, there's a lot of metadata, and we just want to make voice basically the interface to allow you to get to that content, not just by title, but anything that. First thing that I see when I get into the office.